Right, welcome back to another Mayor's Hour. Um, I am in one of my favorite facilities that is one of the cultural anchors in our downtown core, Jack. Uh, in case you didn't remember, <laughs> the, the famous, oh, yes. the voice, <laughs> the legend, Jack Harris, oh, brother. FLA in the morning. Um, this is my cohort in crime. We've been doing this now, Jack, for five years. You've yep. been doing this for 21 years with the Mayor's <laughs> Hour. Yeah, He has outlived many a mayoral tenure, and so he stuck with me now, but it's always it's good to see my friend Jack Harris. Keep the ten years going. <laughs> um, but yeah, we are at the uh, Tampa Museum of Art in downtown Tampa, right next to Curtis Dixon Park. Uh, we have an amazing Peter Max exhibition that is taking place right now. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about um, the future plans for this museum. We're going to meet the uh, relatively new executive director, uh, Michael Tamor, who has been a wonderful addition uh, to our community. He really has energized our arts community and particularly energized the constituency that loves this Tampa museum and so Jack we're ready for another show and we got big things to talk about at the end of the show as well we do we do it's been an exciting couple of weeks since the last time we were together and there's a lot going on and, and you know as we stand here looking out over the Hillsborough River and see uh, what has been announced since we were here together last uh, but more importantly what amazing things are happening inside this building yep I'm looking forward to it all right stay with us we'll be right back I'd love to keep that. Can I hang that in my office? You know what this lo looks like? It looks like a tie. In the mayor's hour. Yeah. All right, Brian. All right, go. here let's we go. go. Here we go. This is the one-time winner. Nice. And he got it again. That's he it. lifted it. And I got my bait back. All right, Jack, uh, we are back with the guy who makes things happen around here. He's the magician. Um, he is, to use a sports analogy, um, because he hasn't been here that long, Michael. Yeah. What's, has it been a year? Yeah, it's been a little a year, a little over a year. Yeah, we, uh, we enticed him here from El Paso, Texas. Uh, he was a first round draft pick for us. And a we, first round draft pick. I yeah, like that yeah, analogy. Yeah, yeah. We are excited to have him here as part of our community. He's brought a, a depth and a breadth that um, we hadn't had before. Um, most importantly, he's a Penn State alumni, which. Uh oh. Uh oh, there's right, a problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And all I had us, nothing to do with the hiring. Us West uh, yeah, Virginia yeah. fans. <laughs> um, but Michael Tamor is the executive director, the president, the CEO of this museum. We are lucky to have you, Michael. Thanks. Thanks. Um, this is our first time to be able to showcase you yeah. and the museum on the Mayor's Hour. Thanks. And uh, we're excited about uh, what you're bringing, the energy that you're bringing, the talent. Well, you know, you, we feed off energies of others. So, you know, coming to Tampa at this time is an exciting time. So the museum is really special, but the community is really special. And what's happening down here on the Riverwalk is just outstanding. And what a better place to be, right, than oh. Tampa at this time. Michael, what is your background? How did you get into what you're doing now? Yeah. Well, um, I'm an academic trained art historian, Penn State um, doctoral um, graduate, and started my career in museums about 22 years ago. And I've been either as a chief curator or running art museums for 16 years before I came here. So this is a, a natural uh, move for me um, to run a really spectacular, one of the best mid-sized museums, I should say, in the Southeast. And we have a lot to offer. So my background really is in art history, um, but for many years now as an administrator, overseeing many different divisions, people think it's just all about art, but it's also a lot about art education and training the public, um, how to read art, but also how to engage in it in different ways. And whether you're an art lover or not, there's a place for you here at the um, Art Museum because we reach out to everyone. So what kind of art did you study in West Virginia? Was it uh, like the dead possum exhibits? Well, I remember they had a centennial winter and it was a picture of an outhouse door <laughs> with wood on it and everything. The friend so th there's a place wanna... for everybody, right? <laughs> There's a place for everybody. No, we've got great initiatives going on now for um, people that are um, dealing with um, physical health issues, mental health issues, but people who love to create art in studio art environments. Um, we're working with the legal community. We've got a great programmer lined
launching Lawyers for the Arts. So really, a place for everybody here, not just people who know and love and want to create art. This is all about culture, it's all about time, history, um, it's all happening here at the Tampa Museum. Michael, what was it that attracted you to Tampa and to this museum in particular? Well, one of the things that I love about what the board wanted to see happen, what the community wanted to see happen, is something I love, which is community engagement. So it's about bringing people into the community and helping them understand that this is really a facility for them. And again, I think that there's this kind of misunderstanding that art museums are just for people who love art. But yeah, really, it's kind of a hoity-toity thing and something like that, and, and yeah. th this is not that kind of an experience, really. It really isn't. I mean, this is about coming in and enjoying at your own level, at your own speed. If you want the art historical context, we can provide that. Um, but really, we want to hear what you think about the art. So we have lots of discussions going on um, with our visitors, something called um, Get Closer, which is about talking about the art and what you see. Um, we have a, a program called Connections, which is we want to hear what you're looking at and why you think you are seeing that. That's about visual vocabulary, but it's also about art history. It's about why this art is created at this particular time, like this great Peter Max, Max exhibition or the Nom Norma Kamali exhibit we have on. What's influencing them and what are they saying about the culture that they live in? And, and then share that with us, and especially with these two exhibits over 50-year time periods. Michael, you know, it's interesting, and Jack, you've been around, and I've been around long enough to see the emergence of this area in downtown Tampa is a cultural arts district. Yeah. Uh, whether it's the visual arts, whether it's the performing arts, you know, you think about the Performing Arts Center and the orchestra and all the things that go on at the Stras. Moving a little bit further, you have the Tampa Museum of Art. You've got the Children's Museum. You've got the Photographic Arts Museum yeah. uh, right across the uh, the, uh, the great lawn here. So there's a there's a synergy here, Michael, that I think you could build on to really create a destination yeah. for whatever type of art you like. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I mean, and to that end, we started this great program with the Photographic Museum and AIA downtown. We're now doing something called Fourth Fridays. So all of the cultural institutions from the aquarium up to the Stras and the parks along the way to the water park, um, Curtis Hickson, McDill, all of us are working together every Fourth Friday um, for a wonderful evening of cultural access, um, food and beverage discounts, and kind of a way to get to understand what's happening downtown. And believe me, that was not a hard sell mm -hmm. for us to come together. And we are getting ready for our, our, our new um, fourth, third, um, fourth um, Friday just coming up around the corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's what's great is <laughs> that we're finally taking advantage of this, the river, having the river here, yeah. and then Curtis Hickson Park. And now we've got the, the water taxis and, and things like that. And that's great. And there, there is so much synergy here in the park area and with the river walk and everything and you put it all together with these cultural institutions from the Stras to here to the Glazer yeah. Museum and it's really fantastic. I mean synergy is the word I think. Yeah. Well we really had the mayor to thank for ushering in that Envision Tampa because that's what yeah. all this discussion was about and it's really come to unfold. So you know the water taxi service has been remarkable. It takes us on fourth Fridays from cultural institution to cultural institution and really it's not just on the river like Tampa Theater's involved in this and the restaurants and organizations along Tampa Street and Florida Street. Everybody wants to see this happen, and it's happening. You know something, Jack, the best view of downtown Tampa is standing on, and I don't know that this is the proper term, but on the veranda of this museum looking back at that skyline at night, oh, you know, yeah. with the plant museum lit up, with the bridges lit up, with the skyline lit up, with Curtis Six and Active, with hundreds of people. I mean, it is a spectacular view of our downtown. Yeah. And are you able to take advantage of Curtis Six in, in your programming? Oh, sure, sure. We, we want to make sure and we integrate. I mean, we just have this fabulous exhibition of the works of Jean Plenza, contemporary Barcelona sculptor, where we had public sculpture on display outside the walls of the museum and it reached yeah. right into the yeah. park and along the yeah. river. In fact, we just purchased one for our, our facility right outside the museum um, on the Poe parking garage side of the entrance to the museum. Fabulous 24-foot um, cast iron, um, beautiful portrait of a woman named Laura. And it's a great way to welcome you to the downtown, <laughs> but to the water, but also to the art museum. Are the, are the kids that go to the Children's Museum, are you finding them migrating over here as well? As well, we are now. We're all about partnerships and community engagement. So Jen Stencil, their new director, and I have talked quite a bit, and we have reciprocity in our membership good. and general good. admission right That's now. That's a good thing. And we're really talking about ways that we can um, create synergy and program partnerships, and I'm excited about it, and so is she. And she's a new arrival from Pennsylvania. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> it's all about bringing talent here, That's Michael. That's right. Uh, the Peter Max, I, I'm, a, I'm not much of an art 
lover or critic, but I love Peter Max yeah. for something. It's like his his work shout at you. Yeah, I mean, do. it's very just loud art. I like that. I like it too. You know, what's so interesting about Peter is that he's really um, coming forth out of a generation of kind of dropouts and um, psychedelic thinking and thinking yeah. outside the box, but also at a time of um, exploration of the stars and the moon and thinking about different ways to connect with one another other than war, which we just come out of World War II and Vietnam and Korea, and, and, and this is about finding love and spirituality and meditation. So all those things can resonate with, with anybody, and really for 50 years of his career, he's connected with the public. And it is about the colors, and it's about how much fun it is, but it's really American. I mean, it really yes, is about it, it, it really an American scenario. That. You know what's interesting, though, and, and this is... The time, certainly, that I remember in the 60s and 70s when I was growing up, when Peter Max was in his heyday, it was, you know, post-Vietnam, civil rights movement, yeah. turmoil in America. It's not dissimilar to where we are right now. That's right. Um, yeah. In terms of sort of where the country is and dealing with some really, really tough issues, as evidenced by, uh, you know, here we are a week out of the, the uh, horrific tragedy in Orlando. I mean, yeah. you know, the country is in a, in a, in a different state, and it's, it's probably appropriate that Peter Max is being displayed right now in yeah. the midst of all of this. I couldn't agree more. And I think that people really, they, they migrate to works like this because it's a respite. It's an opportunity to like give your mind a break from the things that really exist, that harsh reality of sometimes the day-to-day -day and also the national and international. Peter Max really brings you into something that's a little bit, it's fun, it's, it's, it's easy, and it makes you remember that we all still have these great dreams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, and it's so American. I yeah. like that, and it shouts at you. That's, again, I'm, I'm a big fan of Peter Max yeah. art and how long is that going to be here? That exhibit's going to be here through September 9th. Oh, that's so great. It's a nice long run and we've got great summer programming surrounding Good. it. Yeah. So what do you see for the future? What, what are some of the other exhibits you guys are contemplating? Well, we're all set for a great lineup in the fall. As you know, right now we've got Norma Kamali on display, another one of these great artists emerging out of the 60s, but particularly about women's fashion. Women in the workplace talk about civil rights and having women join the workforce. She was right there dressing them and creating style. Um, but this fall, we've got this remarkable exhibition of the great masterpieces from the American Folk Art Museum. So this huge show that deals with this kind of very different way to approach art so by, by artists who aren't really formally trained in the academic setting. We've got a great exhibit of the works of Manuel Carillo, a Mexican photographer who really documented Mexico post-revolution. He's since passed many, many years ago, but it's a great collection that is um, coming in. And we also have this great great contemporary Cuban exhibition. So we are really reaching out in different ways to different parts of our community. We want to engage along those lines. And indeed, even our antiquities collection, we're going to have a great small exhibit that deals with animals in the classics and in our collection. So as you know, we have one of the foremost collections of antiquities in the country, certainly the top collection of antiquities in the southeastern part of the and, country. And you're mentioning the Cuban art, too. That's yeah. going to be a great connection here in the future. That's going to, I think, draw a lot of people here. It's great. You know, the Cuban artists, contemporary Cuban artists have been exhibiting and displaying and producing all throughout the times of the embargo, right? But they've been primarily showing in Europe and they've been having some heydays out there. Now it's time for us to take a look at what's happening because, of course, many people from this community, their generation, their ancestry goes back to, to Cuba even long before the revolution. Yeah. 150 oh, yeah. years beyond. So Our partner's parents came over, mm -hmm. Ted yeah. Webb, and yeah. he's... He, we're a bilingual team. Oh, that's <laughs> great. Morning. Well, he's what language see, do you speak? I, I speak hillbilly and he speaks Cuban. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Well, there'll be a lot of reflection for him and, and maybe what um, was happening in Cuba over the years. It's, it's a dynamic movement right now. Um, that's an interesting way. And we're borrowing a lot of those works from the Brox Museum. They were very early on in collecting contemporary Cuban art. So we work with the artists like Peter Max and Norma Kamali, um, but we also work with institutions like the Brox Museum and the American Museum of Folk Art to bring in works that we might not otherwise have in our permanent collection. Hey, one other thing, too, there's so much more to this building than just the art, because yeah. you've got, of course, a museum store, but also yeah. a great little cafeteria. Mm -hmm. Great idea for people to come down here and have lunch, and then tour, or have dinner, and then tour, or whatever. Absolutely. Our Saturday and Sunday brunches are basically packed. We, we encourage you all to make reservations, but do stop by. But it's great, so if you want to have lunch on Saturday and Sunday and watch the kids play in the kids' park, you actually don't have to leave your dining room 
your own table or you're, you're, where you're sitting, you can watch them right in front of you at Curtis Hickson. But yes, the store is great. The um, merchandise that they have there is unique, great one-of-a-kind designs. And the food at Sono Cafe is fabulous. I hope you have a chance to have some ice cream today. Mm. Well, Michael, we got about 30 seconds left. Um, real quickly, where do you see this museum being in five years? Well, where I, where I see it now, except on a much larger scale. So our public programming is really growing exponentially. Our membership base is expanding. Um, the people who want to see this institution provide more to a growing population is clear and it's unequivocal. They mm -hmm. want to see things happen here in a bigger way. So anticipate a larger, um, a larger impact on the community than we are now. And I would say we're already having a pretty big impact today. Well, and then you've also seen folks like Jeff and Penny Vinick, you know, invest and support this museum. So there's a lot of new people, new money, new, right. new ideas, new energy that are coming largely because of Michael's uh, arrival here and, and his uh, his uh, his sense of uh, of what we could be, not necessarily what we have been. That's right. Thank so Michael, you. welcome to Tampa. Thanks. Uh, we'll be right back. Stay with us. We're going to meet uh, some of the folks who make this uh, magic happen here. Uh, but it starts right here with Michael Tamor. Thanks, Michael, for being here. Thank you. We'll be right back. We are so excited at the Tampa Museum of Art to introduce the work of Jaime Plenza in this beautiful new exhibition called The Human Landscape. But Jaime Plenza is one of the most sought after internationally recognized sculptors living today. And what a treat that we have this opportunity to show the variety of works that he's been doing over the last decade. It's the largest um, collection of his works right now in North America that is touring. And we're thrilled to be able to do this exhibit for a couple of reasons. One, he's extremely important and very young. He just turned 60 last year in 2015. And his international acclaim really is preceding him for someone that young in the art world right now. There is nothing but a bright future for him. So to see him at this early stage of his career having such international recognition is remarkable. The part of this exhibition that is truly great for the Tampa Museum of Art is we're setting a new standard on doing both indoor and outdoor sculpture. And I, this is something very important when we're talking to the um, people of our community because we want them to engage in this work at their own level, at their own time and speed knowing that art can be approached um, on any different level um, with, with or without any type of knowledge about the art. This type of art is so approachable and so recognizable from a distance that people immediately embrace it. And we want them to do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And having the artwork outside, public art, the way that we have, is a great new step for this museum, something that um, all of us at the Tampa Museum of Art would like to see more often. So this was a great introduction to that. One of the things that Jaume Plenza is so recognizable for outside of his um, formal portraits um, are portraits that are made up of words and letters that represent different cultures um, or different great artists, composers, especially those that are um, not just composing literature but composing music. And so there's a beautiful work in the exhibition um, that um, deals with um, the cascading down of words um, that are from great composers of poetry and literature. It um, is an opportunity to listen to the words as, um, as if they were wind chimes. It's a, it's a um, please touch opportunity, um, carefully, to um, create the sound of words um, so that they have music to them as well as um, beautiful compositions in the, in the way that the sentences unfold. One of the great signature pieces of Jaume Plenza's work um, are his monumental portraits of women. And there is a 24 foot tall cast iron portrait of a woman named Laura. The, paint, the piece itself is called Laura with Bun because her hair is pulled up um, and rests on the back of her head. This type of portrait is something that Jaume Plenza is extremely well known for. And this is a signature piece, not only in his career, um, but also um, in this exhibition and a piece that should not be missed. What this place needs is better graduation rates. What this place needs is less childhood obesity. What this place needs is free help with taxes. What this place needs is healthy breakfast. What this place needs is fitness programs for kids. What this place needs is early readers. What this place needs is mentors for teens. What this place needs is people to join us. What this place needs 
is you. To donate or volunteer, go to unitedway.org. Don't worry, the 74 people were picked before me in the NFL draft. To fight childhood obesity, United Way and the NFL are helping kids play at least 60 minutes a day. Okay, time for the team obstacle course. Yay! What this place needs is more healthy kids. To get involved or donate, go to unitedway.org slash play60. Now I get it. Hamilton was adopted from a rescue in 2008. He's quite the pug about town. He gets invited to a lot of parties. He knows he's a pretty big deal. I do not love him. Jack, we are back uh, with Seth Pedlick, who's the chief curator, and there's another part of that title <laughs> involving the antiquities that I can't remember because it's way too long. Um, but he is the guy, he is the brains. You know, Michael is runs the show, but this is the one who is the acknowledged expert in all things art. Um, I would imagine every time you rotate an exhibition, you have to get well-versed on it. Yeah, it's a fun job. I get to learn about a lot of different kinds of art. So tell us about the Peter Max thing, sorry, Jack. Well, Peter Max, uh, a very exciting artist. Um, this show is particularly interesting because although Peter Max is perhaps best known for what he did in the 1960s and 70s, this show is called Peter Max 50 Years of Cosmic Dreaming, and it really does cover 50 years of his career. And so um, the earliest works in the show are from 1965, and the most recent ones are from 2015. Wow. So, so he's still painting. Yeah. He's still painting. Yeah. yeah, he's not quite as young as he used to be, but he's still drawing and painting every day and some of the things he's painting today look very different from what he did long ago and other things look quite similar and really interesting to have a show like this where you can sort of trace the arc of an artist's career and see how he goes back and forth between different I always things. like to think of him like a pop artist yes. almost. Yeah. It's, it's pop art. I mean it, it really is. Well one of the interesting things about Peter Max, like a lot of very successful artists, is that he's a little bit dis difficult to classify and so yes there are certainly some aspects of his art that people would say are pop art. Certainly he was very popular yeah. and interested in pop culture. Um, and in this room we see a lot of uh, portraits of famous people from around the world and that's something that we see also in other pop artists work. Um, but there are other aspects of his style that remind us of all sorts of different movements across the course of art history, and that's one of the interesting things about this show. I, I think of him, I, I, I associate him with the peace movement yeah, back in the 1960s. Yeah, absolutely. That turned into riots and everything else, but I mean, from that standpoint, he was one of the, he protested with art, I think. He did, and I think that's one of the great things about Peter Max, is that unlike some artists who are really restricted to the world of the visual arts, which doesn't necessarily touch everyone in, in the world, everyone in the community, he was able to harness the power of his art towards larger movements, like the peace movement that you mentioned, um, environmentalism is another one, yeah. um, lots of good things, right? We, we like to come to art museums and maybe rest our, our minds from some of the difficult things going on in the world um, and think about happier things and also think about the good things that art can do, and I think those are areas where Peter Max shines. Well, his colors are just striking. I mean, it really reminds me of growing up as a kid in the 60s, um, you know, in the whole Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement. And, you know, you see Dr. King there and you see Nelson Mandela and you see some of these other pretty amazing uh, pictures. What he does with color is really striking. Absolutely. He, he's a huge fan of color from the beginning until the current day. Um, I have young kids and they love to color and paint with bright colors and they absolutely love this show because of the those bright colors. I think it speaks to people. It's it's welcoming. It's it's not something that people feel like they have to learn a lot about art history to understand. It's very welcoming. And like the, these, they got three examples here of the Statue of Liberty, and each one almost conveys something different. I mean, it, it, it's yeah. it's the same thing, the same look, obviously, because the statue doesn't change. Absolutely. But the paintings change dramatically. Right. From one and there, the other. there are great stories actually behind these paintings. We have three of them on this wall and even more across the gallery on the other side. Um, and we could have filled the entire exhibition only with Peter Max's Statues of Liberty. Yeah, I'm wondering, um, what was his, it was almost like an obsession with him or what? <laughs> Some might say that. I'm not sure if Peter would yeah. say 
obsession, but it actually started in 1976 with our country's bicentennial. He decided um, to commemorate that by painting one painting of the Statue of Liberty, and then the next year he painted two, and the next year three, and so on. In 1981, uh, President Reagan invited Peter Max to come to the White House, and so in 1981 there were going to be six paintings, and he invited Peter Max to come and do his six paintings at the White House, uh, which he did, and while he was there, uh, Peter Max was speaking with the President and Mrs. Reagan about the state of the Statue of Liberty, which was not as good then as it is today, and saying it, it really is in need of some uh, renovation, refurbishment. Can you help with that? And they said, unfortunately, there's no public funding for this right now. And Peter left that visit sort of thinking in his head, what can I do? And this goes back to what we were talking about, how he was able to harness the power of his art towards larger causes. He was able to meet with Lee Iacocca, chairman of Chrysler Corporation, and Mr. Iacocca, together with Peter Max, spearheaded this huge fundraising campaign which reached thousands of people to raise the necessary funds to restore the Statue of Liberty. Several years later, to celebrate the reopening, I think this was 1986, Peter Max was part of those festivities, and she was lit up with fireworks during the 4th of July, and that's what inspired these really bright, colorful paintings that we're standing in front of today. And Michael uh, Tamor said that he was here recently, and you had the opportunity to meet with him and interact with him. How was that for you as a... Well, as a, it's always a little bit nerve-wracking when you have the artist coming like here with in. us, right? <laughs> Not at all. No, 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 okay. <laughs> Sorry, I yeah. thought I tried to... <laughs> <laughs> right, when I'm talking with, with other people, they will sort of defer to me as the expert, but when I'm talking to the artist, I'll defer to him or her as the expert, and so there's always a little bit of um, anxiety, nervousness. Is he going to be happy with the way I've presented his work and the way my team has presented his work? Was he happy? He was very happy, great. and so I was happy. And um, I made some comments at, at a little reception that we had, and he was in the front row nodding, which was good to see. I didn't want him shaking his head saying, no, 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 that's not right. So I think my understanding is about right. Where, where does he live now? He still lives in New York City. Um, he, he has lived in New York City most of his adult life, but had a very interesting childhood, which we see in some of his artwork. So he was born in Germany, moved as a very young child with his family uh, to China, where he spent almost 10 years, I think. Mm -hmm. While he was there, he visited Tibet, which we see reflected in, in some of his artwork then moved to Israel, where he had a lot of exposure um, to astronomy. He's, he spent time at an observatory there, uh, also worked with a, a fairly successful expressionist painter while in Israel, then to Paris, where he spent time at great museums like the Louvre, and then finally to New York City, and that's where he has made his home. And where he certainly made his name here certainly, in America. Certainly, yeah. I mean, we see him as an all-American artist, an American icon. But it's important to remember some of these earlier, um, earlier periods in his life and how those impacted what he went on to do. So w what is your background, Seth? It's very far from this artwork, yeah. actually. My training is as a classical archaeologist, an ancient art historian. My specialty is ancient Greek vase painting. Oh, wow. And so I was initially hired here at the museum, here's the long title, yeah. as the Richard E. Perry Curator of Greek and Roman Art. I was and, just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> and I still hold that title as well as Chief Curator, but my area of expertise is antiquities, and, and we have a very strong collection of antiquities. Antiquity, certainly the best in the state of Florida. That's great. And, and where, where were you born? Where'd you go to school? I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah, good. Uh, went to college at Dartmouth College and then graduate school at UCLA. And so I moved here from Los Angeles. Not a Penn State grad. No, no not, not all of us can achieve that <laughs> no, lofty no, academic no, standards. No, Michael and I are in a class of our own at a university that's in a class of its own. Oh, brother. So what attracted you to, yeah, I know, you shouldn't have asked me. What attracted you to this? opportunity. Well, I, as I said, I, I trained in ancient art history, and to come to a place like Tampa that has an endowed position um, for someone to take care of a Greek and Roman collection was very attractive to me. Um, my wife and I also moved here when we had a young child, and we loved Los Angeles, but Tampa's a little bit smaller and more manageable, and it has been a great place to raise our kids. Now, I understand uh, Peter Max also was a commercial artist at one time. He was very successful in that vein as well. Yeah. 
yeah, so uh, he has had a lot of success in museums with exhibitions like this, but of course is very, very well known for a lot of the commercial products that, that he created. Um, so really at the height of his early success, the late 60s, early 70s, um, he appeared in Life Magazine, on the Ed Sullivan Show, uh, so You've so got on. a cover of Life here, and it talks right. about how rich he's become in the Life Magazines from back in, in yeah, the 60s. And that's September of 1969, I think. Yeah. But one of the things that it shows in that magazine is Peter Max with some of the merchandise that he helped create. I think his most famous commission was with General Electric. And we actually have an original GE clock on the wall in the next gallery that, that's still working. Um, so he, he had all of these licensing agreements that allowed him to reach really millions and millions of people rather than the thousands of people that you might meet if you restrict your practice to museums and, and art galleries. And this is going to be here through September 9th. That's correct. Uh, and, uh how, how extensive is it? We've been in a couple of rooms, and uh, the portraits are fascinating. Uh, I, I'm sure these people didn't sit for these portraits. He didn't no. put pictures or whatever. But. So the, the exhibition is about 90 works altogether, mostly paintings and prints, uh, a lot of the posters from the 60s, uh, which people are very familiar with, paintings in this room that I would call portraits, even the Statue of Liberty. She's not a living person, but I think we could say this yeah, is a portrait, a portrait of the yeah. Statue of Liberty. Um, and then the third gallery of the show is some of his more expressionist paintings. So again, the bright colors that we see here, but with a lot of the themes and characters that he created and returned to over the course of his career. So the cosmic runner, the umbrella man, the lady profiles, a lot of the things that people think of when they think of Peter Max. So Seth, we got about two minutes left in this segment. What do you um, see for this museum moving forward? I mean, what, what's the, Michael talked a little bit about some of the exhibits coming down the line. What else would you like to see as part of your of uh, this amazing facility, other than Greek antiquities. <laughs> well, I, I would like to see uh, our collections continue to grow. I think Michael mentioned this spectacular Jaume Plenza mm -hmm. sculpture that we purchased that stands outside the museum. I would love to do more outdoor sculptures like that. I would love to add more things to the permanent collection in, in the antiquities collection, but also in our other areas. Um, and I think connecting these areas, which can sometimes seem a little bit disparate, right? So we collect and display classical antiquities on the one hand, and then take a break for many centuries and start again, usually in the 19th century, 19th, 20th, 21st centuries. And sometimes we're able to find great ways to bridge those gaps. And that's the thing that I would like to see more of. Have you ever thought about a, an exhibit of the statues of mayors? <laughs> that's a great idea, Mr. Mayor. We'll, Just we'll out start of curiosity. Who's your favorite artist? Well, my favorite artist is the is someone most people haven't heard of. He's, he's called Siriskos. He's the guy that I wrote my dissertation on. So he's an ancient Greek vase painter. You're right. No one's ever heard yeah. of him. <laughs> Stay with us. We'll be right back. Seth. Are you going to you. Are you, are you outro him with his full title? No, I don't remember. It's, it's the Perry <laughs> it's, it's fine. Chair for Antiquities and <laughs> Former Mayors. Um, stay with us. We'll be right back. Thanks. So. <laughs> Jack. You are Jack, right? Yes. <laughs> We're really fashionable now. We are. I mean, we're, we're, they might confuse us with supermodels. Like <laughs> we are sporting, uh, what is it? What's Something name? Kamali. Nor Norma Kamali's type of sunglasses. As, it, as you can see, we are in a fashion exhibit in the Tampa Museum of Art, which I think is probably one of the first times they've had a fashion exhibit here in what is normally some place that you would come to look at paintings or Peter Max exhibits. Yeah, this is something you might find, you'd think you'd find in a department store. Absolutely, but you know, or, or in a high fashion uh, exhibit in New York City. Uh, we are with uh, Joanna Robotham, did I say that correctly? You did, thank you. Yeah. Um, who sort of curates this particular exhibit. Joanna, tell us exactly what this is and why it's here at the Tampa Museum and why are we wearing these glasses? <laughs> well, first and foremost, Norma Kamali, this exhibition is the first time, as you mentioned, that we have hosted a fashion exhibition and we're really thrilled that Norma is the subject um, of our first show because she's just been honored with one of the biggest awards in the fashion industry. The Council for the Fashion of Designers in America, the CFDA, just awarded her with the Jeffrey Bean Lifetime Achievement Award. And that award recognizes um, important designers who have really changed and altered the fashion landscape. 
So she just was awarded this um, last Monday, and we are thrilled to be able to celebrate her legacy here in this exhibition. So what you'll see is just a survey of her designs from the past 50 years. Norma started, started to design in the late 1960s, wow. and she's been incredibly prolific. So what you see here is a sample of some of the designs that uh, she came up with in the 60s that are still a main part of her collection today. I want to bring up a fashion question here. You mentioned Jeffrey Bean. I've heard of that name. Mm -hmm. and I, I think I've had Jeffrey Bean clothes or something like that. Does he do men's stuff? Exactly. He's known for his menswear line. He, You might even have a pair of his glasses. So again, it's a very big um, honor to be awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award from well, your peers. Jack's wife, Joy, buys all his clothes. <laughs> no, I have no say. <laughs> well, that's whatsoever. probably a good thing, Jack. <laughs> it is. She's COO and CEO and CFO of the house. So, so how does a, a designer like her stay current, given the way design changes and, and taste change and fashion changes? That's, that's a really great question. I think Norma always has her fingers on what's happening. Um, she's always been based in New York. She's very active. Um, she was actually initially very interested in being an artist. She wanted to be a painter, mm. um, but she went to school for fashion illustration, so I think design and fashion and art have always really been a huge inspiration for her. Um, she started her first boutique probably in her 20s or so, and she grew her business from a small boutique to a, a large global enterprise. So today, if you go to New York, you will visit her store on West 56th Street, and you'll see not only the designs that we have here in the exhibition, but you'll see her wellness cafe. And the idea of health and fitness is a really huge part of her brand today. That's one of the things I've seen in the past are pictures of that fashion designers have designed clothes and they do it and it's almost like some of the Peter Max stuff we've seen out there. I mean, it's sketchy and all that kind of thing. Right, for example, like I think um, I've seen designs of her sleeping bag coats, which are um, in front of us here. Um, that she designed in the 60s and she has numerous drawings, numerous reconfigurations of it. So each piece in the show, you'll see almost a new iteration of it, kind of each collection or each line. So it's just a new, kind of a new approach to an old design. Is it challenging for designers like her to create things that everyday average Americans will purchase? Not for Norma, and I think that's what's so great about her, that Norma is really committed to the versatility of her clothes. For example, most of the clothes in her line you can wear and just throw in the washing machine. She's always been very interested in being accessible to her customers, so she's created not only a high-end line, but she's always been really committed to having a lower-end lower line that people could buy at um, companies such as Walmart. She had a really great partnership with Walmart where a dress like this would retail for, I think, less and fifty dollars. Mm. So I mean, we're, we're going to talk about this dress a little bit later on. Yes, we are. And I'm looking at all the bathing suits. One of them mm -hmm. in particular over here. I, if I had a daughter, I'm not sure I'd want her running around in that thing. But and and the thing on her head is sure. that like a bathing cap or something or that women used to wear? Well, Norma's actually been long celebrated for her swimwear line. Um, right behind you, Jack, is the Fair Fawcett swimsuit, oh, and I yeah. think this is something that really helped launch Norma's swimsuit career. Um, what she's known for, and so what you can see in some of these stud swimsuits, is reinventing just a basic one-piece swimsuit. While we're pretty used to kind of the low cut, what Norma's done on a lot of lines is raise raise the leg cut so it's much um, a much sleeker look that really places more <coughs> emphasis on a woman's curve so she's really I think interested really known for bringing a sexier cut to this now, there's the word sexier <laughs> didn't know if I could use that or not <laughs> now I would prefer that my 15 year old wear the sleeping bag swimsuit <laughs> I don't think that that's goes a swimsuit. from head to toe <laughs> as opposed to some of these suits I don't think that's and a she designed something like there. that for me that she locks probably, at the neck and locks at the ankles? <laughs> she would probably be open to it. I good, think Norma really wants to make all of her clients um, feel comfortable in their clothes. So yeah. whatever you feel would Well, that, that would be the you. request of every dad of a 15-year-old daughter. Oh, it's true. Big market. There's a big market out there for that. But these are really one of her most popular designs. If you open up any fashion magazine, you will see a lot of celebrities wearing her stud outfits. They're quite quite popular. I've never thought so much of fashion as being, well, I guess I've heard before that fashion is art, uh, but you never tend to think of fashions as being part of an exhibit at a museum, particularly our Tampa 
type of museum of art. How did that all come about? Has that ever happened before? Oh, absolutely. I think fashion exhibitions are really a um, wonderful way for museums to engage with the fashion and design community. For example, the Metropolitan Museum is quite well known for their exhibitions that they put on um, through their Costume Institute. Um, a lot of museums have really wonderful textile and costume departments, and they use that as inspiration for exhibitions. So I think now a, a lot of museums around the country really want to bring in fashion and show the correlation between art and design, art mm -hmm. and fashion. I wonder if they have a blue blazer exhibit. You think that would <laughs> You know, I think well? there probably, I there probably will be one someday. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think you're ever going to have When, when men's, guys like me are extinct? <laughs> you're never going to have a men's exhibit. Well, if he's wearing a dark suit and a red tie yeah. or a blue tie or whatever it might be. But what is it, what are glamazons? Glamazons, that, that is a really wonderful, fun word to say. We don't have any glamazons in this front room, but glamazons are uh, larger than life cutouts that Norma has um, styled in her designs. We'll see them in the next gallery if you come visit the exhibition once it's open. They are eight feet tall and they are all sporting different designs from her 2012 collection. And they were one way for Norma to rethink the fashion show format. She, I think after a while, felt very tired of just sending women down the runway. She wanted to jazz it up a little bit. So she created these large cutouts and thought people could interact with them, look at them, compare, you know, stand and see these very large, large cutouts of fashion. She thought it was just a fun new way to uh, create a fashion show. And, and this fashion show really does reflect, it's all through many years, I think you pointed out, that it's, it starts way, way back. Uh, about when does it begin? I mean, as far as I see some very old looking fashions here, and then of course things like that, which I'm not sure if it's current or not. I haven't been to the beach. Sure. Weeks. <laughs> I think, you know, much along the lines of the In Peter your Speedo? <laughs> <laughs> no way, Jose. With studs on it? <laughs> What's interesting is that all three of the shows that we have on view right now really celebrate the past 50 years and the productivity of these artists from the late 1960s to today. So, for example, uh, the all in one dress that I'm wearing was something that she created in the early 70s. Um, so, you'll see a broad range of things, again, that she just, you know, keeps coming back to to keep her line timeless and um, what's really I think great about it is that generations of women have been wearing Norma's clothes so while um, you know perhaps someone who first wore Norma's clothes in the 70s or 80s um, might be very familiar with Norma's clothes I think a younger generation is still continuing to rediscover and um, kind of maybe refresh their closet with new designs that Norma's made in the past few years. We've got about a minute left in this segment. Tell, me, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get to this point in your career? And um, my background is um, quite interesting. Um, most curators, I think, come from an art history or museum studies background. I have a uh, degree in curatorial studies from the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College, which trains contemporary curators, which is slightly different that we are trained, I think, to work really one-on-one -on -one with artists. So it's, um, I think I'm trained to really work collaboratively with um, artist studios and artists themselves. So you have a lot of patience, huh? <laughs> yes, I think part of um, being a contemporary curator is being able to have a lot of patience and um, manage the egos. Just, I think, really trying to be flexible. Every any that's a nice way to any say moment, it. something new flexible. can come up. Yeah. So you just have to kind of roll with the punches. Because they are generally pretty low-key kinds of folks, aren't they? And you know, not combustible <laughs> or not you know no drama ego. inclined. No ego, nothing like <laughs> well, that. Well, they are really. I think for me, they're really wonderful people. That's what. That's why I came into the field. So they, you know. It's every show, every project is different, and that's what's so fun about being a curator. All right, well, stay with us. Uh, Jack Harris is going to put the all-in-one dress on, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, this is like a sight that you you can't, you do not want to miss. <laughs> I this, don't want to see that. This is a very, this is better than Jack in the speedo. Uh, <laughs> so, Joanna, you're going to help us get him into that all-in-one dress. Absolutely. And, and we're going to put him up here on display, and it will be even more popular than Peter Max. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Jack, we're back uh, with the all-in-one dress. Joanna's about to explain to us exactly what this is. What that means, yeah. an all-in-one dress. Apparently it's uh, something pretty significant, otherwise it wouldn't be here. I think you are wearing one. I am definitely, I'm wearing one. Thank you very much. This so, is a dress that we're actually um, selling in our museum store downstairs. It retails for $120, and I think it's a great purchase for any woman to have in her, in her um, closet. 
<laughs> and so what exactly uh, is the all-in-one dress? I'm afraid to touch it for, for fear something will fall off um, or be exposed. So I'm, I'm going to let you <laughs> I'm going to let you do whatever it is that you do and I'm going to stand right over here. Great. Well, the all-in-one dress is a dress that can be worn in eight, nine, ten, twelve different formations. I have it um, styled similarly to the mannequin, but we can adjust the sleeves to create a few other different styles and I'll show you. Wait a minute. Where are the sleeves? Yeah. Let me show you. So if I untie her sleeves from around her neck, here are her oh, sleeves. Oh, that's the sleeves. And what's great about it is that you can wear it wear it to work and have a nice black, little black dress to wear to work. And if you want to go out at night, you can turn it into a sleeveless kind of pocket dress just I'm noticing by. these sleeves are a hair low here for her arms. <laughs> right, and what's great about them is that you could tuck them into themselves and create a nice little pocket for yourself. And it just drapes into it. Jack, you, you will look smashing in, in that outfit the next time Only you enjoy your outfit. occasions. <laughs> Are you getting yours in there? Oh, look Ooh. at that. There we go. There you go. That's perfect. And you can also style it so it's off the shoulder, similar to the one behind you, Jack. We well, have, actually, we don't have the off the shoulder on that one, but we do have the strapless version. This is not off the shoulder? This is not off the shoulder. This is um, just a regular That's going to be hanging pretty low if it goes any lower than off the shoulder here. Another look. My daughter's not wearing that one either. <laughs> another look that I like is just to tie it somewhat casually around your waist. Just kind of feather it, you know. Tie it down like that, or you can create a jazzier look again and bring it behind the shoulders. And this would be a nice look for a cocktail hour. Again, it just presents a lot of different varieties, oh. variations. It's a really nice, lightweight jersey material, and if you get food, wine, anything on it, you can just throw it in the washing machine and it will come back to its nice natural shape. This actually, the top here, is really great. It doesn't stretch out. You might think that once you put it over your head and you know put it around your body that it would stretch out, but it doesn't. So it's a really nice outfit, I think, for women to wear. Uh, I don't know that women, though, just want to have one dress. <laughs> Most of them have a pretty large bunch Oh, there. you're on your own now, brother. <laughs> I'm not going there. I don't know. Well, I'm just to start on the shoes next, Jack. <laughs> You're really going to get yourself in trouble at all. I'm wondering about Joy is watching this. Honey, just one dress. That's all you're getting there. See, less closet space. I'll show you, you how to one. change it. Yeah, you only have to have one dress hanging in that well, closet. Five, five, but in different colors. So then you'll be good. Well, there you go. Now yeah. you're covered. Yeah. It's true. It comes in a range of colors, so you can have five of these dresses, and you have 40 different looks. See, there you go, Jack. Woo. So, That's for example, behind you, Jack, we have one of the um, a mini on the top of her that looks like her tops is actually an all-in-one mini. Our, ma our mannequins are quite tall and this now, is the dress. I was going to say that uh, as a mini would come well, I don't know, so maybe that, that, pull it down. So. That skirt is the same It's as the this. same dress that's just pulled down and tied into a skirt. And what's really great too is that she makes it in this other material too, this sweatshirt material. Norma was one of the first designers to make casual and active wear in the early 80s and she was thrilled to be able to take a common material like a terry cloth robe or a sweatshirt and turn it into um, an all-in-one dress. So again, another range of material that she's um, really explored and made into something extraordinary. She seems to be big on hats too, or whatever those things are on her hips. She is. She's. Um, these are her signature turbans. So I think they're really quite fun. Turbans. turbans. We clearly are, are not no, up on the current I, language. I, I thought it was a hat. <laughs> hat. <laughs> with, with turbans. Yeah, yes. that's it. With little nails in it or whatever those things are. They're quite fun. We've had a really great time dressing all these mannequins. Um, I think it can be challenging to, um, you know, try to address 
the significance of a fashion designer and why it's important to show this type of um, exhibition in a museum, but we're just really excited to show another great innovative artist who's had such a tremendous legacy and impact on women's fashion. And I understand that even though this show will not run for a couple weeks, that Norma's going to be here tomorrow. Today is what, the 16th? Yeah. So she'll be here the 17th for an exhibit and you're going to get a chance to do a QA and a with her? Absolutely. We're really thrilled to host Norma here in Tampa and tomorrow night we will um, celebrate the exhibition opening. We're doing a Q&A and she will be signing books. She just released a um, book on health and wellness that she's really excited about. Well, what's even more important, Jack, is Joanna has just moved here from New York City. So this is another great example of Tampa attracting wonderful talent from all over the world. Uh, so we're happy to have you. Thank you. Uh, happy you're registered to, be here. to vote already, aren't you? Absolutely. Okay. I just received that's my good. voter <laughs> registration card this week. Just made that's a very important. That's very, very, very important. It's almost like your water bill. <laughs> um, but we're excited to have her. And she's going to be a great addition to this museum and to this community. Uh, so stay with us. Uh, Jack and I will close this out with some of the great things that have been happening in the last month or so. Lots uh, of Joanna, about. welcome to Tampa. Thank you so much, Mayor. And, and uh, you know, I, I like Jack's idea about getting my wife five of these because that would allow more room for my ties in the closet. So <laughs> stay with us. We'll be right back. Jack, we're back for the um, final segment. We're here at the Sono Cafe, which is a great uh, little restaurant here at the bottom of the Tampa Museum of Art. Um, I'm exhausted from our journey through the dresses and Peter Max and, <laughs> and, and the one dress, the all-in-one dress. And actually, there's some right here that you can come and buy uh, at the museum if you want to. But if you want a great respite on the Riverwalk and a place to come and get some great food, um, the proprietor, Marianne Frank, is the owner of Miso Plus. Yeah, that's about the best food you're going to find anywhere. I mean, she's award-winning. Yes, she is. So come on down to Sono Cafe in the Tampa Museum of Art and come and enjoy the uh, best view in downtown Tampa. Mm, that is spectacular. Mm -hmm. Open over on UT and the minarets and then on down, which is ultimately going to be a pretty special park and area over Absolutely. here. Your next project. And then, of course, the river walk and all of the amenities along here. It's really mm -hmm. fantastic. Mm -hmm. You had, uh, we got big things happening anyway. I mean, we've talked so much about everything that's going to be happening with the, what we affectionately call Vinnick Bill, mm -hmm. which he doesn't like that, but <laughs> we'll call it that anyway. Um, but I mean, in the channel side area and then going on north from the channel side area, all the talk that's going to be happening around the port area there. But now the newest is the Heights. Mm -hmm. All of the excitement about the Heights with the developer, uh, that's going to be the next booming area, I think. You know, Jack, um, we broke ground or made the announcement this week. I think that is probably the best undeveloped piece of property in the southeast United States. Now, for those of you that don't know where it is, it's right next to the Ulele restaurant, which everyone really has fallen in love with. There's 23 acres there that are completely ripe for redevelopment. You have the old Tampa trolley barn there, uh, so that will be the anchor for that redevelopment plan. They're going to repurpose that trolley barn with retail, with you know food court type, but not. Food We're talking court about like the armature building. building. Yeah, the, the, armature, yeah, armature, the armature building. Yeah. yeah, which was the original trolley barn. That's yeah. where the old, the old trolleys were maintained. So you're going to have office and retail there. You're going to have restaurants. They will build and finish the river walk from Eulalie all the way to the North Boulevard Bridge. There'll be a couple dozen boat slips there. They'll be uh, residential. Uh, the first project is a three or 400 unit apartment complex called the Pearl. Uh, there'll be office there, hopefully a hotel in the middle of it. That, that parcel will anchor the northern end of the river walk. Uh, so you'll be able to walk from the North Boulevard Bridge all the way to the Channel Side Bridges um, and past the Museum of Art, past the Straz, past Curtis Hickson. And what's even nicer is we've started to see the redevelopment occur on the west side of the Hillsborough River as well. Yeah, you've got big plans for that. I do. For what's I going do. to be happening there? Um, you know, I, I've got to move quickly to get most of it finished. Um, but the Tribune building is going to come down in the next couple weeks. Um, is there'll be 400 units of residential on that parcel. City Council thankfully approved the money so we could redo Julian B. Lane Park, which is 23 acres on the river. 
uh, much, much of the public housing um, along the interstate and on the water um, is boarded up and almost ready for demolition. So we, all the pieces are starting to come together. So. I mean, this river is going to be something really, really special, as we've talked about many, many times. And I, I don't know if it would fit in with all the development there. I've driven down around the Heights when uh, I know they began talking about a possibility that there could be a raised stadium mm -hmm. in that area, too. And I don't know if that would fit in, but it would seem possible that it would. And you're basically extending the downtown over there. And of course, the Rays would love to be in that kind of an environment. They would. Um, I'm not sure the owners are interested. I mean, my sense is they're committed to this redevelopment effort. Um, you know, the Ray, that would, would be a great site for the Rays, but I don't think that that's going to occur. I think they are, you know, five years into this plan, and that's what they want to do. Um, there are other sites potentially for the Rays that, that could complement that, that we could connect that to. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, a, a stadium on the waterfront, looking back at the skyline, I mean, really would be a special, special place. Yeah, and that whole area there has a great view of downtown. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're looking at the water and then downtown and everything. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's going to be a, a fabulous place. Um, and of course, looking to transportation, that becomes a big issue mm -hmm. because it's become a thorny issue. For some reason, I don't know why we can't keep up with the rest of the country on transportation, but you know, Jack, um, you and I share that frustration and the inability of the, uh, the county commission to even give the voters an opportunity to choose for themselves. Yeah, I mean, it, it would be one thing if the voters said no. Yeah, but to not give them the choice, that really is unfortunate, and that, and I think that unwillingness to look at a long-term. Uh, plan that it's funded um, that addresses all of the different jurisdictions and needs and the needs of the county are very different than the needs of the city yeah um, I think the uh, the demagoguery and the hyperbole and the just downright uh, misinformation that was uh, put out about that was unfortunate yeah and it's and again the voters aren't going to get a chance and the real tragedy is too that Tallahassee won't allow you to have a municipal vote because we know from the past vote that a transportation plan would pass overwhelmingly yes. within the city and I'm sure Buddy Dyer has the same concerns over in Orlando as well. But, but the difference is Orlando already has the first leg of Sunrail. Yeah, CSX. They, 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 they were CSX able to get that done. Right. Yeah, and we've had the offer from CSX, mm -hmm. but we're not taking advantage of it. Well, for commuter rail. All I can say is elections matter. And if you want to change the discussion, then change some of those elected officials. Um, there'll be an opportunity this fall. Uh, some of them will be on the ballot. And I would encourage anyone who's watching this to take a good hard look at who voted in favor of it, um, who voted to deny us the opportunity to, to even decide for ourselves and, and vote accordingly. Well, it's going to take some time. <laughs> it will. But for right now, Jack and I are enjoying some amazing gelato here at Sono Cafe. Come on down if you haven't been here. This really is one of the best places along the Tampa Riverwalk to uh, experience what we've been talking about, to come see this amazing museum, uh, to enjoy what I think, Jack, is the best amenity that we have as a city, which is our waterfront, and to imagine what this place could look like 10 years from now. So we'll see you next month. Jack and I are going to finish this gelato and uh, have a safe summer, and uh, we'll be back again in August. Take care. Thanks.